These are the very worst situations in which people manage to survive in the form of an iceberg. It includes stories of plane crash survivors, castaways, soldiers, and much deeper and scarier situations in which people escaped and thus outsmarted death. We'll start with the more strange ones and progress all down to the unbelievable things that you would never think anybody could have survived. Let's begin with Alexander Selkirk. What would you do if you were alone on an island with no humans and little survival skills? Would you give up or move on? For Alexander Selkirk, he would rather die trying to survive than give up. Now dubbed the original Robin Crusoe because he inspired the original story, Selkirk was a Scottish pirate who was a castaway for four years and four months on an uninhabited island in the South Pacific Ocean. Selkirk had initially volunteered to be left on that island because he felt their vessel was not seaworthy, and he was not wrong. He was then left with his sea chest, which contained clothes and bedding, a firelock, some powder, bullets and tobacco, a hatchet, a knife, a kettle, and a Bible among others. Soon his supply ran out, and he was left reading his Bible and singing hymns while using his survival skills. He ate spiny lobsters for food and was soon driven away by sea lions. Now inland, the smart man derived milk and meat from feral goats and spices from pink peppercorns. While chasing prey, he fell off a cliff and could not move for a day. He was rescued in 1709 by Woodis Rogers and his companions from the island. Miracle of the Andes tells the story of survivors from the Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571, which was nothing short of a miracle. So, on 13th October 1972, the flight was supposed to ferry the old Christian Club rugby reunion team and supporters for a game in Chile. The flight carrying 45 passengers, including the crew, had a tiny problem, an inexperienced pilot. The pilot miscalculated, leading them to crash into the Andes mountain. Twelve people died immediately and starvation, sub-zero temperature, and exposure killed 13 more. The remaining survivors made a pact that others should eat their bodies for survival upon their death. Since they would die without help, two survivors named Nando Parado and Roberto Canessa set out to seek help. After climbing and trekking for 10 days, they reached Chile. 72 days after the crash, in December 1972, Thanks to the bravery of the two men, the other 14 survivors were rescued from the site. Miracles or science, which should we believe? Harrison Ojigba Okin was a cook on a ship capsized by a rogue wave off the coast of Nigeria. According to him, while the 11 crew members were locked away in their cabin, he woke up early to use the bathroom. Naked and pants down is one hell of a way to face disaster, but his bathroom trip saved him from the doom faced by the crew members. Now the only survivor, he went to the engine room, where he found a pocket of air. By this time, the boat was underwater, with Harrison hearing what sounded like sharks eating his mates and crayfish nibbling on his own body. Harrison remained there, naked and with a bottle of coke, till divers from a nearby rig rescued him three days later. This is a story of pain and near-death experience. Aaron Ralston was out canyoneering alone through Blue John Canyon when tragedy struck. While he was descending, a large boulder dislodged and smashed his left hand, then crushed his right hand into the canyon wall. Aaron had no way of calling for help, so he spent five days sipping his water and eating burritos while trying to release his arm from its trap hold. After failed attempts to amputate his arm and break free, on the fifth day, Aaron started to survive on his own urine, and he carved his name, Dob and his presumed death day on the rock. He hallucinated through the night, and at dawn, he spent an hour through the painful process of amputating his forearm with a multi-tool. On his hike out of the canyon, he met with a family on vacation who later got him help. Terry Jo Dupereau was the lone survivor of the mass murder of her family and the captain's wife by the captain of their vacation boat, Julian Harvey. Harvey had initially intended to kill his wife on the Bluebell to collect her indemnity insurance but the other members of the Dupereau family may have been witnesses who had to be kept quiet. Terry had survived because she was asleep in the lower cabin of the ship. When she woke up to screaming, Harvey slapped her and told her to go back while he escaped. Since the ship was sinking, Terry remembered the single life raft aboard, and she took the tiny boat into the ocean to help her escape. She spent three grueling days floating on it without covering from the sun, food, or water before she was found and rescued by officers on Captain Theo, a cargo ship. And the last on Tier 1 is Chris McCandless. Chris McCandless's story is a bit unusual from other stories you have heard on this iceberg, and here is why. 
McCandless was an adventurer enthusiastic about a nomadic lifestyle. After numerous adventures, some of which he was ill-equipped and highly untrained for, he made it to a trail in Alaska where he lived on a bus, surviving on his meager supply and what little he could gather from the bushes. After living on the bus for over two months, he attempted to head back to civilization, but the watercourse at the river he had crossed earlier was now higher and swifter. He posted an SOS note on the bus declaring his need for help and that he was scouting for food nearby. Sadly, no help came, and he was found by a group of hunters looking for shelter on 6th of September 1992. He was later discovered to have died of starvation. He may not have survived the whole adventure, but his story is definitely worth mentioning. And in Tier 2, we kickstart with HMS Bounty. Bounty was a vessel belonging to the British Royal Navy, tasked with a voyage to gather breadfruit for enslaved workers around the 18th century. After a difficult journey, the officers made it to Tahiti and spent five months enjoying the island's pleasures, including the women. Trouble struck the peaceful crew when the officers began to rebel against the vessel's captain, William Bly. The officers refused to leave the welcoming island and plotted a mutiny against Bly. The rebelling officers put their captain and his loyalists on a boat and sent them away. The officers journeyed in hunger and rough conditions, with many dying before they got home. After 47 days of wild journeying, they finally arrived home to report the rebellion to the Crown. While much may not be known about Juana Maria's life, historical accounts after she was rescued said she was content. Juana Maria was popularly known as the Lone Woman and for influencing the Island of the Blue Dolphins. Juana Maria lived alone on the San Nicolas Island in California for an estimated 18 years. She is the last surviving woman of her tribe who was left behind for unknown reasons, except for mere speculations on the internet. True accounts of her discovery, and even her real name, are relatively unknown as nobody could detect her language but she was found in a crude hut made of whale bones. Juana Maria was fascinated by civilization upon her arrival at the Santa Barbara mission, where she lived for seven weeks before she died of dysentery. Six teenage boys, in what could only be described as youthful exuberance, ran away from their boarding school on a stolen boat with little to no preparation. But a storm wrecked their boat on the uninhabited island of Atta. They swam for 36 hours to get to shore. Now on land, the boys dug a cave by hand and depended on seabirds for eggs, meat, and blood, which they used for water when they had none. After three months, they revived the ruins of a village and camped there, eating feral chickens, wild taro, and bananas. The boys settled into a routine, splitting kitchen, gardening, and guard duties within themselves. After 15 months in September 1966, Peter Warner, a lobster fisherman, rescued the boys whose funerals had been held after confirming their identity and took them home. Next up, we have Jesus Vidana, the man who had to become a fan of raw fish to survive. In 2005, Vidana and four other men left the Mexican fishing port hoping to catch sharks. They exhausted their fuel before they could achieve their mission or even begin it and a strong wind cast them adrift. Without a radio, the men could not call for help and were left alone. They ate raw fish, seagulls, sea turtles, meat, blood, bones, and eggs, and survived for nine months, crossing two-thirds of the Pacific Ocean. Sadly, two of the men refused to eat raw food, so they died of starvation after two months. They continued westward, and on 9th of their August 2006, their boat was spotted by a tuna fishing vessel. They were rescued and tended for 13 days before they disembarked at Majuro, and they were handed over to local authorities. Meduse is one of the most infamous ship rakes ever. She was a French naval warship armed to ferry French officials to St. Louis in Senegal for a political assignment. On the way, Meduse ran into trouble and became a total loss. The 400 passengers on board evacuated, with 146 men and one woman taking refuge on a raft. However, it didn't work out, and some were washed ashore. The other drunk people killed some officers, and when supplies dwindled, some survivors took to cannibalism. After 13 days, 15 people were rescued, but five died within days, and after another 54 days, three of the 17 people who stayed back on Meduse were rescued. 
This one is definitely a rare miracle. 17-year-old Julian Kopka fell from the sky in December 1971 from Lanza Flight 508 after the plane was struck by lightning at midnight. Kopka found herself still strapped to her row of seats and fell 10,000 feet into the Amazon forest. The young girl survived the fall, but was injured with a broken collarbone, concussion, a deep cut to her right arm, and injury to the eye. She spent 11 days in the rainforest, making her way through the water and dealing with insect bites and infestation to her injury. She found an encampment after nine days, where she gave herself first aid by pouring gasoline on her arm to stop the maggots. A few hours later, salvation came to her when the owners of the encampment, a group of fishermen, found her. She became the lone survivor of the crash. Douglas Mawson was a scientist who conceived and undertook an expedition to collect scientific data responsible for groundbreaking progress in numerous fields in Australia. After gathering a party, he set out with them for the Antarctic expedition in 1911. After setting up camp, the 18 men divided themselves into six groups and set off to different parts for research. Mawson and two others were assigned to Cape Denison and they took off. A month later, one of the men fell into a deep crevasse with their supplies. Mawson and Mertz mourned him and continued, but Mertz died later after they ate their dog for survival. Now physically falling apart, Mawson made it to base in 30 days by surviving on little portions of food he found on the way. After surviving a blizzard and deadly fall, he arrived at the base but missed the ship. Six men waited behind for his party, and they waited another 10 months to be rescued while they compiled their accounts. To be vile and deranged seems like a way of life for people like Lawrence Singleton because, what the hell? 15-year-old Mary Vincent was picked up by Singleton while she hitchhiked from California to Las Vegas after visiting with her grandfather for a while. Mary Vincent began to suspect the order man soon after he started going the wrong way, but it was too late for her to run away. He knocked her unconscious with a sledgehammer, tied her up, and violently raped her after which he freed her by cutting off her forearms with a hatchet and throwing her off a cliff. All was not over for the young girl, as she was starved of blood from the stumps of her forearms by dipping them in mud and holding them up. After walking naked for three miles, she found help from a couple who took her for medical care. After this dumbass brutally tortured an innocent 15-year-old girl, he was released on good behavior from prison after only eight years and stabbed another woman to death. Unbelievable. Sir Ernest Shackleton was on a heroic expedition with 27 companions from 1914 to 1917. Around October 1915, the ship Endurance sank due to park ice in the sea, leaving them stranded. Shackleton, known for his courage and good leadership, decided to seek help after they made it to Elephant Island. Shackleton picked five men plus himself to travel to South Georgia on the James Caird to get help. The men set out for the journey under the worst weather conditions. The sea made their travel difficult, and three men became unwell after a while. Shackleton knew they could not continue, so he forced them to stop. He left with the remaining two and made a 36 HR's trek to seek help. That evening, he found help for the three men left behind, and three months plus many attempts later, they rescued the party at Elephant Island, and the entire crew was taken to safety. Philip Ashton was captured by pirates during a fishing trip and he was often threatened to cooperate by the crew. Ashton escaped by hiding in the jungle when the party came to an island, and he was abandoned there. Ashton lived on fruits to survive till he met another castaway who spent only a few days with him but never returned. Luckily, the man left behind a knife, and Ashton began to hunt tortoises and crayfish. He survived for 16 months, fighting off insect bites, alligators, and tropical heat till he was rescued by the diamond a ship from Massachusetts. Marcus Luttrell is a former U.S. Navy SEAL who is the only survivor of Operation Red Wings in Afghanistan. During a lookout, some local herdsmen spotted them, but the team could not attack them since the herdsmen were unarmed, so they freed them. Later, the four-man team on the lookout was ambushed by suspected Taliban fighters. Three of the men were killed, and Luttrell was left with multiple injuries. Members of their unit attempted a rescue during the firefight, but their helicopter was shot down, and all aboard were killed. Luttrell was later rescued and put into hiding by the villagers to save his life. Tammy's story is that of loss, survival, and heartbreak as she was forced to withhold the mourning of her lover for immediate survival. The two lovers were victims of one of the most horrific hurricanes to ever occur, 
Hurricane Raymond, they were two capable sailors hired to deliver a yacht from Tahiti to San Diego, and with many experiences between them, though that was to be their farthest journey yet, they felt they could make it. About two weeks into the trip, they were caught in the path of the deadly Hurricane Raymond, and the last thing Tammy remembered of her fiancé, Richard, was a scream. When she regained consciousness, she was in the wrecked boat with no sign of Richard, and she struggled with makeshift materials and survived on canned food for 41 days before she reached Hawaii. Balzrud's story was the epitome of kindness and empathy, which were the two gifts extended to him by others to help him survive the brutal Nazi soldiers after his life. Balzrud was the lone survivor of a covert operation gone wrong due to a case of mistaken identity. The German authorities attacked them when their cover was blown, and Balzrud's escape was beyond reason. His escape was just the beginning as he became stranded in enemy territory as a wanted man with only one boot and no supplies. Balsrud was passed on from one house to another for safety, with the Nazi soldiers hot on his trail. By then, a bullet from the gunfight had seared his big toe. Balsrud used numerous disguises, swam through ice water, was snowblind, frostbitten, and starved for most of the journey. He used a pocket knife to cut off nine of his toes to save his feet. After evading capture for about two months, now on the verge of suicide, he was helped to the border of Finland, from where he got more help and safety. Much of the known details about Man of the Hole, also known as Tanaru, are from observations or speculation. Tanaru lived on the run as the surviving member of his tribe due to the genocide of Native Americans in Brazil. The man, whose real name and tribe were unknown, moved from one place to another. Living in similar huts, he built from scratch and eating fruits, honey, wild game, and things he planted. When he was eventually discovered, he refused contact and went about his business, living in similar conditions as he moved. In August 2022, he was found dead without any form of disturbance, as though he was waiting for death in his last home by an agent from the agency constantly observing him. At the age of 11, Norman Olestad possessed and demonstrated a valiance that most adults cannot boast. Little Norman traveled with his father and his girlfriend Sandra to Big Bear Mountain in a Cessna for a supposed trophy. The Cessna came to the middle of a raging storm that claimed the life of the pilot, the senior Olestad, and injured Sandra. But Norman was unhurt, at least not physically. Following his father's teachings to never give up and never lose heart, the young boy grabbed Sandra by hand and slowly descended from 2,600 meters of altitude. Sandra slipped out of his hand at some point, but Norman continued for nine intense and lonely hours before he got to safety. Jerome's story will always be unknown, but the man must have experienced some of the hardest things in life that he never spoke of. Jerome was rescued along the beach of Sandy Cove, Nova Scotia, by an eight-year-old boy. The young boy found poor Jerome without legs, his two legs had been cleanly amputated and the stumps were still wrapped. It was said that perhaps he was a stowaway, maybe he had a fortune that he was discarded for another to inherit, or perhaps he slept in an ice-cold sawmill where he caught an infection that resulted in the amputation. Two things are clear. Jerome was of Italian descent, and he was clearly a burden to someone in New Brunswick who discarded him. Jerome lived in his new district for about 60 years, being passed around a few times without talking or revealing anything about his story. James Morrill was an English sailor who journeyed on the vessel Peruvian. Luck was clearly not on their side as the vessel was shipwrecked midway. About 22 passengers, including the captain and his family, were aboard, but 21 made it out of the bad wreck on a raft with only a few supplies. Four weeks into the voyage, some of them began to die off, and the survivors used the legs of the dead people to bait sharks for food. 42 days later, seven people made it to safety, and they settled in a camp where three more died, leaving Marill and the captain's family. Two weeks later, people from the aboriginal clan saw them on shore and took them in. The captain's family would later die some two years later, leaving Marill as the lone survivor who spent another 17 years with those people and their culture. Looks like the crew had a plan to see Santa at the North Pole, but had problems with coordination. So. The Polaris expedition was supposed to be a serious attempt to reach the North Pole. The expedition was commanded by Charles Hall, but there seemed to be a case of insubordination and perhaps tribal warfare in his crew, as he was deemed too uneducated to lead. Soon after, 
Hall died a suspicious death from poison after having coffee, and the crew began to face issues. Power was left in the hands of a drunk who couldn't pilot the affairs of the ship well enough, and they were soon in disarray. Several members wandered off from the ship, and the ship soon ran into problems. After much wandering around, the remaining 14 crew members were spotted by a whale in 1873 and returned home through Scotland. Leon Crane's ordeal began after a routine test flight had trouble in mid-air with an engine. Crane saved his life by using a parachute to fly down, where he landed hip-deep in snow. He shouted for help, but soon realized that he was alone. With no food or supplies to live on, he knew he had to move or freeze to death in the awful weather. For nine days, he huddled at an improvised campsite, wrapping and unwrapping himself with a parachute due to the cold. He moved along, drinking only water till he met a fully stocked but unoccupied cabin owned by a trapper. He ate and continued his journey with some supplies, but they were too heavy, so he dropped them. After another tedious trek, he met another cabin, but this time it was occupied by another trapper who helped him back home after 84 days of hardship and survival. So the custom of the sea guides officers and crews at sea, and one custom is the practice of cannibalism by survivors of a shipwreck. So were these men wrong or wrong? Dudley and Stevens were part of the four-man crew for Yacht Mignonette, who were cast adrift with no provision. After nearly three weeks at sea, Richard Parker, the cabin boy, an inexperienced seaman, fell sick due to seawater. Dudley and Stevens voted for him to be killed for food so that they would survive, but Brooks, the third person's consent, wavered. After the incident, they were rescued and brought home, where they gave their account, trusting that the custom of the sea rules would back them up but they were arraigned for trial. The case generated a widespread debate, and the two were found guilty and sentenced to a statutory death penalty with a recommendation for mercy. Getting locked up in prison has never felt so good as it ultimately saved the life of Ludger Silberis. Talk about the good side of a bad coin. Ludger Silberis was thrown into solitary confinement in jail for reasons unknown except for speculations. The following day after his arrest, the city of Saint-Pierre experienced the 1902 eruption of Mount Pelée, which killed 30,000 people and destroyed the town, but Silberus was saved. His cell did not have windows and was ventilated only through a narrow grating in the door facing away from the volcano. His prison was the most sheltered building in the city, and this saved his life. The cell in which he survived still stands today. A rescue team would later save him from the rubble of the prison four days after the eruption, following his scream for help. Aldi Adelang is definitely a very lucky human as he has been adrift not once, not twice, but three times, only that the third time was longer and scarier than the initial two that was less than a week. Adelang is an Indonesian teenager who spent 49 days in the Pacific Ocean alone. Adelang worked as a lamp keeper on a floating fish trap, and on one of his work trips in 2018, the rope securing the fish trap snapped. At first, he didn't panic because he felt help would come and he had a month's worth of food with him. But when his water ran out, Adelang began to fear that he may never see his parents again. Adelang survived by drinking salt water filtered through his shirt and eating fish. 49 days later, he was picked up by a tanker bound for Japan James Riley was the captain of the ship Commerce. During one of their trips, they were shipwrecked around the coast of the Western Sahara, and he led his crew through the Sahara Desert in search of safety. Riley and his crew were captured by Sahrawi natives, who kept them as slaves. They were treated terribly and fed with cow milk and urine while being forced to work. Now near death and hopeless, Riley devised a plan, and he persuaded another Arab named Hamet to buy him off his masters and take him to a port city far off the north where he hoped to gain freedom. Luckily, his plan worked, and upon arrival, Riley contacted the local British consul, who secured his release from Hammett. The Jeanette expedition was undertaken in an attempt to reach the North Pole to gather data that would later contribute to scientific research. The Jeanette expedition, headed by Captain DeLong, had a crew of about 33 people to include every hand they would need to make the mission a success. For two years, Jeanette was trapped in sea ice with the crew deriving Plan Bs to survive the situation, but the ice soon returned with a vengeance to damage the ship and crush their hopes. They rescued three boats and supplies and separated into groups. After a long journey, battling starvation and frostbite, 
One party met civilization while the other, including Day Long's party, did not make it. Of the 33 men, 13 returned home with the help of the locals who rescued them. Does the 2014 movie Unbroken sound familiar to you? Louis Zamperini's story inspired the movie. Zamperini was first an Olympic distance runner before joining the military. As a lieutenant, he was involved in a search and rescue mission when his plane crashed into the ocean. He spent 47 very agonizing days on a life raft, surviving on raw fish, but that was only the beginning. Zamperini landed at the Japanese Marshall Island with two other crewmates, where they were captured as war prisoners. He was brutally tortured and severely beaten by a Japanese military personnel named Muchiro Watanabe for his track record as a runner, which is absurd. After being passed around to four prisons, he gained freedom at a coal prison camp after another round of hardship. Gay Jr. was among millions of Americans who joined the Army to fight World War II. He was a pilot with the naval aircraft who fought in the air. Gay Jr. was part of and the lone survivor of the 30 air crews that participated in the ill-fated Battle of Midway. Gay Jr. did not sleep well the previous night, knowing that they may be greatly outnumbered by the Japanese forces, but regardless, he proceeded based on orders the next morning on June 4, 1942. Gay's aircraft fought with determination, even while he was shot in the arm during the fight. After his unit was out of the battle, he continued even with his injured arm, till the enemy force brought down his aircraft. Now floating in the ocean, he hid under the seat cushion for over 30 hours and watched the subsequent bombing attack that took out three of his enemy's aircraft. Gay was later rescued by a naval flying boat and taken for treatment, having lost so much blood. Maurice and Marilyn Bailey were a British married couple who grew tired of their cheerless ordinary lives and decided on an adventure. After six years of careful planning and selling their possessions to build a boat they named Aurelin, they set sail for a more adventurous life, sailing for New Zealand. Everything was going smoothly till an injured whale smashed into and destroyed their boat. The couple managed to save little food and scurried away in their rubber raft leaving their beloved Arlen Sink. Perseverance and strong will kept them adrift for 118 days until they were rescued by a South Korean fishing boat crew. The Cospatrick disaster remains one of the worst in New Zealand history, even though it happened far from home. This is because about 470 people were lost to the occurrence. The ship's voyage was relatively uneventful until midnight, 18th November 1874, when fire broke out in a compartment. All efforts to put out the fire did not work, and they resulted in saving two of the five boats aboard and escaping with only 62 survivors. The two boats stayed together until a storm made them go their separate ways and one of the boats was never seen again. The British scepter found one of the boats 10 days after the fire and only three people survived that were rescued. The story of the tsunami fish is slightly obscure as there are two theories about it. First off, tsunami fishes are very, very rare to come by as they are deep within the ocean. Among the Japanese, some people believe that the sighting of the tsunami fish indicates an impending tsunami, earthquake, or something equally worse that is about to happen. Previously, this type of fish was sighted before such occurrences, such as in 2011. Another account is that the tsunami fish is the last surviving specimen of five striped beak fishes found in a submerged portion of a boat that broke loose and went adrift during the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami. They were discovered in 2013 and four were euthanized for certain concerns. The last one is now on display at the Seaside Aquarium. John King was the sole survivor of the Burke and Will expedition. John King, one of the expedition assistants, witnessed a disagreement between Burke, the expedition leader, and the second in command, who quit immediately. The men experienced flooding rains and swamps, so they never saw the open ocean. During the journey, Burke split the crew to go different ways, but King remained with Burke's party. As their resources dwindled and they remained exposed, some of the men began to die. Burke's team was down to four men. After a fruitless attempt to reach Mount Hopeless, they returned to port, where Burke and another crew member died. King survived due to the kindness of an Aboriginal clan for two and a half months before he was rescued by Alfred Howitt. For now, Lopez was a soldier who was the first person to permanently inhabit the island of St. Helena. He accompanied the Portuguese governor of India on his conquest of Goa. 
The governor later left Lopez and some others in Goa for another mission. Lopez and his companions adopted the people's Islamic religion and married their women. When the governor returned, he punished the betrayers, and Lopez, as the leader of the group, suffered the harshest as he was tied to a wooden post and his nose, ears, right arm, and left thumb severed off. While some died, Lopez and other survivors fled to the jungle to hide themselves. Five years later, he tried to visit Portugal, but the boat stopped for supplies at St. Helena, and he remained there. He would later go on to live there in solitude for 10 years before visiting Portugal and going back to live there alone for another 20 years before his death. The Vergolda Drake story was a story of doom like no other. It was a ship commanded by Peter Albert Soon to sail for Batavia with about 193 crew members. During the journey, the party lost two crew members, and after then, six months into the voyage, the ship struck a submerged coral reef. Sadly, only 75 survivors made it to shore, including the captain. Nine days after the loss of Virgul de Drake, seven crew members were dispatched to summon for help in Batavia. 41 days after their departure, they arrived in a pitiable condition, and the search for the other survivors began. From 1656 to 1659, over four rescue attempts were executed, but they were unsuccessful, and they led to the death of more people. One of the world's scariest things has to be the moment a person is faced with death, with no option of escape. This was what happened to 18 of the 19 people in the Ross Cleveland, a commercial fishing boat that sank off the coast of Iceland due to bad weather. The last distress signal from the captain, almost two hours before the boat's disappearance, said, I am going. Give my love and the crew's love to their wives and families. Two days later, the lone survivor of the Ross Cleverland was washed ashore and he found his way to shelter. Bolinau 52 is a documentary movie that tells the story of the real-life tragedy that befell the people of Vietnam as they fled from the 1975 Vietnam War. Generally, all of them who fled by sea were referred to as boat people, and many had varying stories. However, the particular account by the documentary recounts that the people were stranded on the Pacific Ocean in 1988. During their 37-day journey at sea, the group encountered violent storms and engine failures. While they fought their thirst and hunger, a U.S. Navy ship reportedly refused to rescue them after they met them. The people starved despite resulting in cannibalism, and out of the 110 people on board, only 52 survived the tragedy with help from Filipino fishermen who took them to Bolinao in the Philippines. Marguerite was a woman to know because she stood by her love to the very last. Her story would no doubt make a good movie for the screens. Marguerite, who was of noble birth, accompanied her relative named Roberval on a journey to the New World after he became Lieutenant General. Roberval was only aware of Marguerite's old nurse as her only companion, but he later discovered she had taken her young lover along. Informed by his strong Calvinist principles, Roberval cast Marguerite and her nurse from his ship into the island of demons, but her lover was said to have escaped to join her. They lived off a few provisions, some guns, and a bit of ammunition, which Roberval had left for Marguerite and her lover to build them a crude shelter. Marguerite's lover, her baby, and her nurse later died from starvation and poor living conditions before she was found after a few years and returned to France. James Turner was the radio officer on Manar, one of the first British merchantmen that sunk during the Second World War. When the ship was attacked by the German submarine U-38, James Turner kept sending SOS signals. Most of the crew abandoned the ship at some point, but Turner would not leave the other two crew members behind. Turner tried to start a lifeboat to help them escape to the master's boat, but it was difficult since he was still under fire from the enemy, and in the process, one of the injured men died. He later succeeded and escaped with the other crew members to the master's boat. The boat that subsequently carried Turner was also destroyed by the enemy, and he lost a leg, but he survived the war. Adela Wotherspoon was the youngest and oldest living survivor of the General Slocum fire incident of 1904. The fire started due to a carelessly discarded cigarette or match, and continued spreading due to a lack of proper safety materials on the boat. 
the steamboat was chartered to convey the members of a church to a picnic, but 1,021 of those people out of the 1,342 people aboard lost their lives. Adela was a six-month-old infant at the time of the disaster, making her the youngest survivor of the ordeal. She lived to be 100 years old and died in the year 2004. These men needed to be lost to solve a family mystery of almost 50 years. Both men, 53 and 26 years of age, set out from their homes in the Pacific nation of Kiribati on a journey of about 80 kilometers to get gas. The men were adrift for 33 days with no way of calling for help since their signal system was out of batteries, but they found much needed food and water on Namdrik Island. It was not unusual for people from Kiribati to wound up on the island after losing their way, getting lost at sea or something. On getting to Namdrik Island, they found out that they had family there, made by their uncle, who some 50 years ago they thought to have drowned at sea. Unfortunately, their uncle had died before the reunion, but he made a family whom they met. The men were later rescued after they washed ashore on Marshall Island. And the last on Tier 6 is Cambodian Jungle Girl. The Jungle Girl is a Vietnamese woman who emerged naked from a jungle in Cambodia around 2007 in a filthy condition. A man's attention was drawn to her after he caught her stealing food from a lunch pack, and he caught her with the help of some friends. Some reports claim that she was a feral child, which has been debunked. Sao Lu, a man from the next village, in a case of mistaken identity, claimed her as his lost daughter. But she found it difficult to cope with a relatively normal life. In 2016, her real father located her, claiming that she went missing in 2006 at the age of 23 after suffering from a mental breakdown, and he only discovered her after seeing a Facebook post. After a formal verification, her adoptive family released her to her real parents. Gonzalo de Vigo was only a young Galician boy when he enrolled as a cabin boy on Ferdinand Magellan's expedition. Only two of the five ships that left for the expedition made it far enough De Vigo was on the Trinidad, one of the surviving ships, and the ship soon ran into severe damage. After that, numerous deaths began to occur on board due to diseases and hunger. De Vigo later deserted the ship at the now Mariana Island, and he stayed there with the people of the island for four years, mainly depending on them for survival. The doctors declared it a grim situation, but the McCloys relied on faith and were not disappointed. Randall McCloy was the only survivor of the 29 people involved in the deadly Sago mine disaster of 2006. With his fellow miners, McCloy had gone to work as usual shortly after a methane ignition triggered an explosion, sending out smoke, debris, and carbon monoxide into the working section of the mine. One call miner died immediately. 16 escaped, and 12 were trapped, so they awaited rescue. 41 hours later, only McCloy was alive as the others died from carbon monoxide asphyxiation. At the time of the rescue, McCloy was hanging on by a thread, now in a coma with kidney, lung, liver, and heart damage, and spent weeks in Morgantown, where he was treated for severe brain injuries. Narcisse was a 14-year-old cabin boy who journeyed with the ill-fated vessel St. Paul to convey 300-plus Chinese passengers. Poor weather soon changed the course of the trip, and St. Paul was quickly shipwrecked. Narcisse became part of a small survivor party that set out on a longboat for Cape York. Now marooned in Cape York, weak and malnourished from all the journey, he was rescued by three Aboriginal women, and he would later stay with the tribe for 17 years, learning and becoming a part of their culture. This is the story of the most extraordinary woman of her time, as dubbed by Monbodo, the Scottish philosopher. Marie Angelique was a feral child of the 18th century who spent 10 years living in the wild forests of France, presumably between 9 to 19 years of age. She was captured by villagers in Songhi in Champagne in September 1731. Marie Angelique survived 10 long years without any form of irreversible deterioration of mind and body as she was able to read and write in her later years after many years of mutism. During the 10 years, she survived a plague that almost killed her and was able to protect herself from wolves with a wooden club. Remember the Jeanette expedition? Melville was the leader of its sole surviving party after his engineering skills helped keep the boat afloat until it was finally damaged two years later. After a long journey filled with hardship and absolute worry over the survival of their other crew members, Melville's party reached the Siberian shore. It obtained help at the mouth of the Lena River. The following spring, he led an expedition to find the remains of Jeanette's captain, DeLong, and his party. 
Cabrice's story is a very interesting one as he started life as a sailor at the young age of 14 and later became a tribesman. Cabrice embarked on numerous trips with different captains and eventually served in the Royal Army. After recovering from his war injuries, he joined the crew of a whaler and their ship eventually got shipwrecked. Desperate for survival, he joined the Nuku Hiva people on Marquesas Island after deserting his ship. Cabris was integrated into the tribe and was tattooed all over as a sign of his acceptance. Daikokuya Kodayu was the captain of the ship Shishomaru that set sail for Yedo around 1782. On their way, the ship was caught in a storm and was blown off course, which led them adrift for seven months, during which one man died. Not long after, they landed on the island Amchitka, where the Russians and Alayut people lived. After an incident on the island, a Russian ship came to pick them up, but it sank in front of them. Kodayu's crew and the Russians would later escape from the island on a handmade boat, to the astonishment of a French diplomat. After moving around for a while, two members of the crew stayed back with their hosts. Twelve died, and only Kodayu made it home to Japan nine years later with Catherine the Great's help. In 2002, 62-year-old Van Pham took his sailboat on a voyage without a radio on his boat, nor had he filed a float plan. Since he had no family, nobody reported him missing when a sudden storm wrecked his mast and he was cast adrift. He survived on fish, birds, seagulls, turtles, and rainwater caught in a bucket and occupied his time by watching television since he had installed solar power on the boat. After three months and a half on the Pacific Ocean, he was rescued by a U.S. naval team on a mission in September 2002. Ishii was the last known member of his tribe, the Native American Yahi people, who were brutally murdered in the 19th century California genocide. Ishii is an adoptive name for the man whose tradition forbade him from saying his name until he is introduced by another person. So, his real name was never known for obvious reasons. Ishii initially escaped the genocide with some family members, but some died and others drowned as they scurried around for survival. After spending a couple of years in the wilderness, now starving and alone, he emerged close to a slaughterhouse in California at age 50 and was discovered. Ishii moved around a bit but spent the last five years of his life as a janitor, living with two anthropologists in a university building in San Francisco before dying at 55. Betty Moat was the sole passenger aboard the Columbine, a ship sailing to Lerwick, where she was to see a doctor, visit her sister, and sell her knitting. The weather quickly turned bad, and the captain was washed overboard. The other two crew members tried to rescue the captain with a smaller boat, but the attempt was unsuccessful, and they could not make it back on the Columbine, as it was still on sale. Now alone and with little provision, Betty suffered from seasickness and extreme cold since she was below the deck. She survived for nine days, sitting and holding tightly to a rope until the Columbine ran aground off the coast of Norway, and she was rescued by some kind-hearted fishermen who heard her screaming for help from around the area. Rodriguez lived a hard life and only began to learn how to be human again in his 20s after living in the wild with wolves as his companion since age seven. From his account, starting from that age, he was left to fend for himself and live in the wild. Until he was found at the age of 19, he lived alone, far from civilization in the Sierra Morena. He was raised by wolves who sheltered and protected him and with no humans to interact with. Rodriguez could only bark, chirp, screech, and howl until he was taught the ways of humans again. Twelve years later, police found him in the mountains wrapped in a deerskin, and they caught him. From there, he began his reintegration into society again. And the final tier on this iceberg begins with Chunosuke Matsuyama. What do you know about messages in a bottle? If you're thinking of a romantic tale in there, it is a no, as this was an SOS. Chuno Suke was a Japanese seaman who traveled with about 43 other people to find barrier treasures on a Pacific island. On their way, trouble struck when a storm blew their ship onto a coral reef and wrecked. The men looked for cover on a nearby island and sent a message for help using wood from a coconut tree to write letters. Chuno Suke placed his letters for aid in a bottle and sent it afloat, hoping they would get help when someone found it. Sadly, his message was not found until about 150 years later when it washed up in his birth village, but by then, it was too late because they were dead. Al-Zamel is one of the 11 survivors of the 2014 Malta migrant shipwreck. As a Syrian refugee in Egypt, her suffering did not end there as she had to leave Egypt with her fiancé through the aid of some people smugglers. 
but the people smugglers rammed up the boat and in no distant time, the ship capsized. Al Zamel's fiance and over 500 people died on the ill-fated boat while two families gave her their infants to care for. Al Zamel was at a crossroads as he did not know how to swim, but somehow she made it work. After four days at sea, a merchant vessel found her and other survivors, including the infants, and saved them. Barnard's story is the classic cliche of when your good deed gets you in trouble. Charles Barnard was the captain of the American sealer, Nanina. In 1812, on its trip, Nanina rescued a British ship's crew after a shipwreck. Barnard soon got a message that their nations were at war with each other. He informed the castaways, but agreed to rescue them anyway. But he realized that the food on board would not be enough for both crew, so he decided to scout for more. During his absence, the British castaways seized Nanina, leaving Barnard and his men on New Island. Barnard and his crew stayed there until they were rescued in 1814 by a British whaler. 150 years ago, Otokichi was a 14-year-old serving as a crew member on a rice transport ship. Not long after, the ship was caught in a storm and was blown off course far out in the Pacific Ocean. The ship drifted for 14 months during which the crew lived on seawater and rice off their cargo. Several crew members died of diseases, but Otokichi and two others made it to Cape Alava and were rescued, though briefly enslaved by the tribespeople. Andrei Tolstik was seven at the time he was discovered by social workers in Siberia. His mother took off while he was only three months old, leaving him with his alcoholic and invalid father, who later left him also. Andrei remained at the mercy of his family's guard dog who protected and raised him till he was discovered. At the time of his birth, Andrei was discovered to have been born with a speech and hearing problem, which his parents left unattended. Due to his lack of human contact, he picked up behaviors associated with dogs, like sniffing his food. Andre survived the negligence of his parents due to the aid of the social workers and was taken to an orphanage home where he understandably found it difficult to relate with other children. Mayanja's story is similar to that of Andre, only that while Andre was raised by a dog, Mayanja's adoptive family were monkeys, sort of like a replica of the Jungle Book. Not much is known of his story before he was rescued but it is known that he hails from Luero. Mayanja was a victim of the civil unrest in the 1980s, and his parents are suspected of having been killed during the incident. He was believed to be three years old when he was left alone, and he stayed in the wild for another three years. Mayanja survived on fruits, berries, and roots coupled with the mannerisms of the monkeys that raised him. Soldiers of the National Resistance Army found him in a forest in 1985 with a pack of monkeys who put up a fierce fight before letting him go. As the soldiers moved through the bushes, they saw a figure who looked unmistakably like a human being and drew closer. They had to disperse the monkeys to rescue the boy, but it was a struggle because the monkeys put up a fight. One adult female monkey held Mayanja tightly to her bosom in an attempt to protect him. Mayanja was returned to human territory, where he began rehabilitation and therapy to adopt human traits. This deadly plane crash would later change the lives of the four survivors who were a pilot, a politician, a cop, and a criminal. The plane flew into the night, never knowing it would not reach its destination. The plane crashed into a snow-covered wooded hillside in Alberta. Six people, including a famous party man named Grant Noli in the province, died. Four men survived, among them 27-year-old Paul Archambault, a petty criminal being flown to Grande Prairie to face a mischief charge. The cop beside him, Scott Deschamp, had removed Archambault's handcuffs before the plane left Edmonton. It was a move that saved his own life a few hours later. Archambault quickly freed the cop trapped under the remnants of the plane and helped the pilot and the politician get clear of the wreckage. The survivors stayed 17 hours together before help arrived for them. Much of what remains of the story of the shipwrecked sailor has been fictionalized and highly censored as some details of it were unpleasant for the then dictatorship rule in Colombia. However, Gabriel Marquez preserved some of the truer versions from Luis Alejandro Velasco, who was the lone survivor who turned up half dead after the entire ordeal. According to this account, Velasco's boat, the Caldas, was listed due to being overburdened by contraband items on choppy seas, which are prohibited on a military vessel. The crew members were ordered to rebalance the craft, and they struggled till a large wave crashed over Velasco and his fellow sailors, which washed them into the sea. 
The men soon began to struggle to reach the only life raft there was, but only Velasco succeeded because the others drowned. Velasco drifted for 10 days with no provision under the scorching weather with sharks circling his raft. Velasco nears the shoreline with a broken paddle, and when he is almost there, he dove into the water and swam the remaining way through with his last bit of strength. A young woman later found him, and with the help of good people, he was examined by a doctor. He was later reunited with his family. On the morning of 7th December 1941, sailors stood for the raising of the flag as was customary on Ford Island in Pearl Harbor when things like meatballs, or to some fuel tanks, were dropping from the sky. Only that their predictions were wrong. It was a bomb attack from the Japanese that killed 2,403 people and eventually started World War II. James Murray was only 21 years old at the time and was one of the sailors standing for the ritualistic raising of the flag. One of the Japanese plans had come very close to Murray till it pulled away, and Murray and his fellow officers sought cover in a nearby mess hall, a sort of recreation room for the officers. While most people did not make it out alive, James Murray would later be one of the nine survivors of the Pearl Harbor attack to live well into his old age. In 1913, the ship named Carluk became trapped in ice while sailing to a rendezvous point. After a long drift, the boat crashed and sank the following year. In the months that succeeded the ship's demise, the crew of about 25 people suffered through different forms of distress on ice and the shores of Wrangell Island. On the way, the party had to break into different groups to sort out alternative routes and possibly look for aid. Some of those parties did not make it back, and some members of the crew began to die. Carluk's last captain, Captain Barlett, went above and beyond to ensure that help reached his creations, even though he was later blamed for the ice entrapment. However, it did not remove the fact that he contributed significantly to seeing them return home. After much struggle, the bear arrived to rescue the team in September 1914, with only 14 survivors remaining. Barlett ensured that the bear traced each living survivor, who was now grouped in teams across the island, and recovered them all for the journey back to Nome. A five-year-old boy was found roaming around with monkeys and was rescued by some residents in a town in South Africa. With no clue of his name, he was named Saturday after the day he was found and Mindiane was adopted from the name of an orphanage owner, whom he stayed under her care as his surname. When he was found, the boy exhibited common traits attributed to monkeys and would not eat food, bathe, or wear clothes. He favored bananas amongst other fruits he would eat, and he went after raw red meat when he saw it. His rehabilitation was arduous, as he had a hard time learning human habits. Slowly, he adjusted to having baths and wearing clothes, but he still preferred entering a house from the window. Sadly, in 2005, he was killed in a fire. Kim Shin Jo's story is like that of the hunter becoming the hunted. 31. North Korean commandos who underwent crucial training for two years to assassinate the president of South Korea neither achieved their mission nor made it out alive in one piece before the North Korean people descended on them. The men, under special orders for the mission, approached the presidential residence with no hitches until they encountered a group of brothers who were suspicious of them. The brothers ratted them out to the authorities, and a search commenced for the infiltrators. 29 of the commandos died in a gun battle, while one returned home, but Shinjo surrendered. Shinjo later gained pardon and remained in North Korea, but his parents and siblings back home were killed for his perceived betrayal. Kingsley Afosu's story is like a grass to gray story gone wrong as he moved from searching for a better life to fighting against getting murdered. Ofosu and seven other Ghanaian men, including his brother, were stowaways on MC Ruby, a cargo ship in 1992. The men wanted to reach Europe by boat in search of a better life, so they hid aboard. The crew found them six days into the voyage, and all hell broke loose. Fearing the heavy fine awaiting them in the West for bringing in illegal immigrants, the crew members began to kill the men by beating them with iron bars two at a time. Ofosu and his brother were the last two to be brought out, and when they noticed what had happened, they attempted to escape, but his brother was shot. Ofosu escaped back into the bowels of the ship, and after three days, he escaped into France. When the ship reached port, he headed to the authorities. 